welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. The language that a customer will use when describing their problems and their challenges and the desired outcomes, that's the exact same stuff that I use in my work on conversion copy to write compelling headlines and bullet points and structure sales pages. So there is an enormous amount of value beyond just the case study itself. When you are able to capture a customer's experience, record it, listen back to it, analyze the language they use, get a sense for the priorities, the things they brought up over and over and how they talked about it. You can take that same language and use that in your sales and marketing. And it's like showing your customer a mirror. Now they can see themselves in your sales copy. And the way you talk about their problems is the way they talk about their problems. So it's a massive empathy building exercise. Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust you enjoyed my recent conversations with Mel Kettle, communications strategist, and with Sunny Hahn of Atlas Solutions. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Joel Kletke. He's a conversion copywriter. He's founder and case study king of Case Study Buddy, a done-for-you case study writing service that gives B2B businesses an easy way to capture and share their customer success stories. Their case study specialists take care of everything from interviewing your customer to writing the study and managing revisions. Now, as Joel points out on the interview, case studies are an asset whose value is enormous yet often overlooked. Case studies can be used in all parts of the customer marketing journey. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, my business. We help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal clients. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them and why you actually are in business to help them. Now, to help you get this clarity about who your ideal client is, take a look at our Marketing Master mini class. In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an enduring, engaging relationship. Access the Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But more importantly, it's incredibly valuable for your business. And I've just recently added some new information there. So if you, go, if you have been there before, go take a look at the new information that's there. In our discussion today, Joel talked to me about what makes a good case study. And it's all about human connection and the story. He pointed out that the story you tell will be the story you attract. I love that quote. And we talked about transformation, the before, during and after framework of the case study process that Joel and his team use. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Joel Kletke. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Calgary in Alberta, Canada, a lovely place of the world, Joel Kletke, who's the founder and case study king of Case Study Buddy. Welcome to the podcast, Joel. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat. 
Jason Resnick, who was our guest on episode 224 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we get you on the podcast here and have a conversation with you. So big hello to Jason. Yeah, Jason's an awesome guy. I had a wonderful chat with him and uh, just so much insight in that guy. His episode is one that I've got queued up to listen to on your podcast as well. He's just always got <laughs> yeah, something yeah. interesting to share. Yeah, he's. Uh, we've known one another for quite some time. We connected through various communities that we were both in very early in both our businesses and we've been following one another since then. So, yeah, he does have a lot of uh, great insights and a lot of great ideas. For sure. Now, Joel, you're a sought-after consultant. You've worked with companies like HubSpot and WP Engine, among others, so a lot of our uh, audience will know them. Uh, you're focused on conversion copywriting, but you're also kind of taking more time and focus on case study buddy. So I'm really mm -hmm. excited to um, learn more about that today. Your focus there is to help clients create valuable assets for their own companies. And I was uh, at a presentation recently by Glenn Carlson, where he was talking about, you know, the way to grow your business is to build more assets. And so I'm fascinated to learn more about case studies as assets today and looking forward to talking more about that. Before we do get started on that, what were some of the pivotal moments that brought you to where you are today? Sure. So I would say the first is, you know, I, I kind of fell into, um, copywriting. It wasn't something, you know, I, I grew up always loving to write, but it was never something that I saw as like a legitimate career path. Uh, and so I did a business degree and, and it was just so off my radar, this world of writing. Like I didn't want to be an author. I knew that much. I loved writing, you know, fiction and that sort of thing, but I never saw that as viable. It seemed like a real crapshoot to, to ever make that work. And I didn't want to be a journalist and and the whole world of kind of marketing, copywriting, and sales copywriting, I was just oblivious to it. Even having gone through a business degree, we kind of touched on it, but nobody ever really communicated the value of it to me. And so I left university with no clue what I really wanted to do. I knew more about the kind of place I wanted to be and wound up in an agency uh, doing SEO, where I, I stayed for almost five years. And I got to see the inner workings of agencies and businesses. And one of the things that I learned there uh, was that value of copy and the value of telling a story and telling it the right way and and how much gets wrapped up into how you present yourself with, with copy. Uh, and so that led to me going out on my own in, in 2013. I saw kind of the whole digital world turning its attention towards writing as this valuable asset. I thought, if not now, when? If, if I don't make this move now, when? And so originally I went on, my initial focus was mostly on written you know, blog posts and ebooks and content assets. And then I came across the work of this woman named Joanna Weeb, and she turned me on to the conversion copywriting world. And that sent me down a path that led me to working with HubSpot and WP Engine. But for Case Study Buddy, it came out of this moment where I had finished up the work for WP Engine. And somebody who I'd worked with there, who's a very influential guy, just the kind of guy you don't say no to because he's so well-connected, <laughs> uh, presented me with an opportunity. And it was a little bit outside my wheelhouse. He said, hey, I've got this company I'm connected to. Uh, they really need case studies. Is that something you think you could help with? And in my mind, I'm going, maybe. But yeah, I, th I think I can figure mm. it out. But for him, I'm like, yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm all over <laughs> it. I'll take care yeah. of it. And so that sent me uh, down this path of, okay, I, I'm working on a case study for this company called Pingboard, who is still our longest standing client to this day. And I threw myself into it. Anything that I do, I want to learn how it works. I want to understand what goes into it. I want to know how the sausage is made so that I can do it the best possible way. That's just kind of how I'm wired up. And as I was researching and as I was doing the case study, I kind of realized, hey, here's this asset that is way harder to do than people expect, way mm. more valuable than most people understand. Almost everybody, and I think everybody, honestly, if you're in B2B, B2C, it doesn't really matter. Every company needs success stories in their marketing and sales arsenal, but nobody seems to have a really great process or ownership for doing in their companies. And so then I looked around and I thought, well, surely, surely somebody has like planted the flag and said, this is all we do and, yeah, yeah. and we're the best at it. And I quickly realized not really. There was one woman uh, named Casey who was kind of the bona fide specialist, you know, the, the de facto thought leader in the space. And then a whole lot of nothing. There was companies who did it as an add-on service. There was kind of random freelancers who, again, it was one of a whole bunch of different things they did. 
And I kind of looked at that situation and thought, why not me? You know, why not build the company? Why not step up and and be the company that can do this and that can own this space? And so that that kicked things off, and I've been chipping away at that goal ever since. Mm. Yeah, oh, that's a great story. And I, I, there's a c- couple of things I really love about it. And one is the the you know you stepped up and said, yeah, we can do that, and and then we'll figure it out in the back end. Um, but of course, you know, you, you do that from the base of how hard can that be? I should be able to figure that out. So there's a level of confidence, but not closing the door to that opportunity. And the second one I really love is then taking that, realizing that there's an opportunity there and there must be a need there for more than just your one client that you started working with and taking it as a specialization. Yeah, I mean, I prior, you know, it's not like I came at this totally like cold and naked and unaware. You know, I'd done content assets in the past, but case studies were, were a different kind of asset. I'd never worked on one before. And what fascinated me about them, I, I had tried to scale up a content-based business in the past, and it was a total disaster. I had tried to build a, a scale up kind of a blogging type of uh, company. Now, this was in addition to the other work I was already doing, but there's so many pitfalls and things I got wrong and assumptions I made that eventually led to me winding that up. But one of the big challenges that I had with that business was getting people to see and understand. People were very, either they saw the value of paying a decent amount of money to have someone very skilled and talented handle the whole process of putting together content, or they didn't. And with case studies, what I immediately saw was, like I just mentioned, there's this asset that is way harder to do than people expect to do really well. And there's way more to it than even I expected. You know, I kind of thought, well, problem solution results, how hard can it be? You whip it together, you know, it's done. But the more that I worked on it, the more I realized, hey, there's there's a real art to this. And because this isn't just a blog post or, you know, one more, you know, in a, in a long line of different things, because these are harder assets, they're high stakes assets, because people struggle with these, you can charge a premium for them, a premium that maybe you would struggle to charge with, with other things. And that was attractive to me because I thought, okay, you know, it's an asset that not only people struggle with, don't have a process for, but are willing to pay good money to, to have done because when they see the value and when I can show them the value and when I can show them what goes in, it's a very easy sale to close. And that was attractive to me for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. A lot of great points there. Um, I, I'm curious. Well, let's, let's step back first. Um, why? Are case studies so valuable for a business? Sure. Let's start there. So when you think about it, let's let's take software. It's a space I work in quite a lot. In software, we're getting to this point where the barrier to entry is getting lower and lower. So the tools to do it are getting lower and lower. The developer is becoming you know, available. Like it's it's easier than ever to build and launch a software, you know, uh, platform. So you're seeing a lot of feature parity and the people who've been leading for ages are getting, you know, the, their competitors catching up to them and sometimes starting to pass them in terms of features. And when you look at the landscape, what, now that's just software, but look at your industry. People can copy your message. People can copy your design. People can copy your process. But what nobody can take away from you, what will always be uniquely yours are your success stories. Those client success stories, those metrics you earn for people, your proof is just your proof. And that's a big part of what sets you apart. And so in terms of differentiation, I firmly believe, especially in service-based businesses, we're getting to a point where we're going to, you know, we're already seeing so much parity in what people do and how they do it and so on and so forth. But that proof is a massive differentiating factor. I think another big factor for case studies in particular is unlike so many content assets that are limited in their application, case studies can be used across the entire funnel. And when I say that, a lot of people go, wait, what? Isn't this like a bottom of the funnel type of asset? Isn't it something you give to sales and they pass on at the very bottom and kind of gets things over the finish line? And that's what I love is people only see it that way. And so they're missing this massive opportunity across the rest of the spectrum. You can use case studies as a lead gen tool. You can use case studies, you know, those metrics, those success stories, if you position them in a way where you show someone who's struggling with a problem, hey, not only is there a solution for that problem, but we're the best ones to do it. You can use it as a lead gen asset. You can use it as a customer retention asset or a win back asset. So if somebody signed up for a trial, tried it out and left, it can be really hard to 
regenerate interest in a natural way without feeling like you're hounding them. But if you have some basic intel on why they signed up to try that child in the first place, now you can send them a story that says, hey, those things you wanted originally, here's an example of another company who was like you and wanted those same things continued on past where you dropped off and got the thing you wanted. And so from lead gen to customer retention, to winning back, to nurturing and onboarding sequences, um, to even just keeping, you know, with new launches, we talk about coaching, right? I mean, showing new results and ongoing and keeping it current. All of these different things are things that case studies can help you do. And so they work across the entire funnel where other assets are really limited in where they can have an impact. And that's part of what I like is this utility that goes so far. Mm. Yeah, that, that's great. And I've seen quite a few really good examples recently. I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive where people send out in their um, regular emails and they're promoting a product. But they start off with, um, have you ever, hey, Jurgen, have you ever wondered how tough it is to write case studies and and um, let me tell you the story of Joel and then they go on and kind of talk about it in a way that is really clear you know it's a kind of a compelling story that resonates with you so they really address the issues that I have if they do it well and then describe the results that the other person's getting and and you two can have these results so on so that's that's kind of the structure so we'll talk a little bit more about how you approach that later but what what specifically differentiates case studies from say testimonials or even say a video testimonial where somebody might talk a little bit more about what specifically the, uh, the service or product did for them and how it changed them rather than just saying that this is a great business to work with yeah, case studies are kind of like testimonials on steroids. So where a lot of testimonials tend to just focus on the outcome, uh, they tend to just be, this was this was so great, or, you know, we've achieved X result. Case studies really allow you to delve into the problem and the challenges that someone might be feeling and to make those challenges really human and explore them in more detail. When it comes down to it, businesses are just people, right? People run businesses, people have challenges, and to every business challenge, there's a human component. Uh, there's there's this frustration and emotion and desire. And you can capture that in a case study in a way that a simple soundbite or testimonial uh, maybe can't. I think the other thing that case studies allow for is the opportunity to really explore the solution. And typically when we talk about solution, people think about the what, right? What we did. But when I write case studies or my team writes case studies or when we're working with clients, what's equally important to what you did is why you did that in the first place. It's not just how you solve the problem. It's your thinking. It's the approach you took and why you took that approach. Because especially, again, with service-based businesses, but in general, people don't just want a solution. They, they, they say, oh, I just want X result. But what they care about and what gets them invested is when they see that you've thought through those challenges that they have before, and you've tailored your approach to someone like them, and you've really made it work. And so with a case study, you can show, hey, this is something we've considered. We've got a process for it. We can demonstrate and talk about that process. We can tie it into you know, the origin of where that challenge came from, and we can tie it back to a result. So where a, taste, uh, where a testimonial is kind of like a blip, uh, where it's social proof that works well because it's bite-sized and very positive and very results-only driven, case studies really let you tell the whole story and allow people to go through that roller coaster of this is so frustrating. Here's the solution coming in to help solve that problem. And here's what it looked like and felt like to have that problem solved. Mm, yeah, I love that. It sort of goes into the human elements, as you said, and also the story part. So how, how important is storytelling in presenting a, a really good case study like that? Honestly, it's it's one of the biggest challenges and things that even we – uh, keep on working on because the ability to tell a story, our brains are kind of wired up for stories. We gravitate towards stories. I mean, it's the old cliche, but from the time there was campfires, there's people sitting around campfires telling stories. It's how we entertained and we gravitate to stories in our everyday lives. We love, you know, a good rags to riches story. And uh, we we love to hate the, the arch villains in these stories. And so when people think about case studies, all too often, they just think about this very kind of bland you know, sort of like static, here was the problem, here's the bullet point list of stuff we did, here's the solution at the end. But 
To do that is to miss the massive opportunity to bring in, as we were just talking about, that human element. There's people in these stories that felt real feelings and experienced real things. And because we're not selling to robots yet, you know, we don't have AI making all of our purchase decisions and weighing up algorithms because purchase decisions are as much emotional as they're rational. And because we still like to work with people we like. And because we still evaluate these human aspects when we're deciding whether or not we trust somebody or want to work with somebody, when you can bring those pieces into a story, when you can show some personality, uh, when you can talk about those human factors, when you can make it less like this static, cold report of sorts and more of this expose on, hey, here's a person who was just like you and felt the things you're feeling right now. And they have the same doubts that you had when they're considering a solution, but they decide to go for it anyway. And that's another factor too, is people want to make these case studies all glowing all the time. A yeah, great yeah. case study can talk about something that went wrong in the course of providing the solution because stuff goes wrong in real life. It's not that everything has to come across flawless. It's a real story and real stories are relatable. Reports just get read. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I'm listening at the moment to the, um, I love Audible, so I'm, I like to listen to a lot of books. Um, I, at the moment, I'm listening to the Go-Giver series. And I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they tell a fabulous story. And I kind of started the first one and I couldn't stop. I sort of took about four hours to go straight through the book because it was so entertaining. And yet, the message in there is very powerful. So there's a very powerful business message underlying the book, but there's a wonderful story around it. And so I think that that's a really good example of, you know, a story well done will just capture your attention and, and hold you. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, what happened next? You know, what happens next? And, and all the while they're, of course, delivering these valuable business messages as well. So I think what you've described there is, is, using case studies to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, case studies are kind of like a Trojan horse, right? I mean, we want to, in our businesses, we want to tell people what we do and why we're valuable and why we're the best. We want to do that. But because consumers hold all the power now, they can go do the research, they can go read reviews, they can evaluate so much about you before they even talk to a person. Case studies and storytelling in general is a bit like a Trojan horse because it's just like you described. You kind of get hooked on the story and what happened next. And all the while, all those things we want to communicate are being communicated without beating them over the head with it, mm. without this super overt, hard salesy you know, kinds, kinds of approaches. So that's what I love about it too is – like you say, we get hooked on stories. We get excited about stories. We feel things when we read stories. But I can't tell you the last time that I felt something when I was reading, say, a white paper. Now, that's not to yeah, say yeah. white papers <laughs> don't have their place, no. but it's just a different kind of experience. And that's why I think they're so powerful and why I, I really do think more companies um, are starting to pay attention and invest in them and why that storytelling piece, like we're talking about, it, is so critical. We, we have a chance to go beyond uh, what we've done for case studies in the past. And I think that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I, I'm having conversations with some other marketing folks, George Bryant, who was on a podcast episode a few episodes ago, and we were talking about that people don't buy the product. They actually buy the experience and the accountability that that you deliver as part of that experience. But the experience part is really important. So if you can tap into emotions through the story and, and get them to feel the experience that the client in the case study had, then, you know, you're tapping into that experience part. It's so relatable. Yeah. Yeah. It does what you said earlier about the differentiation as well. Yeah. I mean, we, we feel when we're making decisions, it's not like we're robotic. We don't go about it with just a checklist and, you know, yes and yes and yes and check and check and check. We feel things. We wonder things. We get anxious. We question things. And again, with a, with a story, we have the chance to take people through that experience and help them kind of, it's, it's almost cheating a little bit. You, you kind of give them the ability to have that experience before they even have to yeah, connect yeah. with you. Yeah, experience the whole customer journey in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, how do you go about 
sort of constructing a case study from scratch. Let's say I came to you and said, hey, I want to write some, I want to have some case studies put together for my business and for what I've done for some clients. How do you go about that? Yeah. So the first thing, and this was a kind of a wake up call for me is the first thing you do is not sit down and start trying to find people to be featured. Um, for too many businesses, case studies are happy accidents. It's when someone voluntarily puts up their hand and says, I've had a great experience and I'd love to talk about it. And so that's why the case studies are seen as so hard for companies because there's this barrier between, well, how do we get people to actually be willing to share? And, and how do we know someone's got a great story to tell? And so before you go about asking people whether they have a story, you need to do some strategy. You need to sit back and think, okay, where are we going as a business? What are our goals? What are the things, like, are we trying to reach into a new industry? Are we trying to sell to a particular type of leader? Are we trying to grow a particular part of our service? What are our goals? And you start from that point. You start from kind of this internal facing perspective. Mm. And then you think, all right, these are our goals. Let's set them aside for a second. If these are the things we want to do, what types of stories do we have to tell and to who to get us there? Because let's say that, you know, we'll take WP Engine as an example. If I want to work with more kind of enterprise tech companies, then that WP Engine story is a great one. But if I just so happen to work with a yoga instructor on a launch of theirs, and I feature that as my case study, but I'm not really interested in working with yoga instructors on their launches mm -hmm. anymore. Well, I've told the wrong story to the wrong people. So that study can never really do what I need it to do. And so before you go out, just get the story, get the story, you want to step back and say, what are our goals? And given those goals, what types of stories, who do we need to talk to? And that that's where you begin. But from there, it becomes less about you and more about those people. We want to understand what was their experience, what attracted them to you. We want to go through that kind of before, during, after of their story. So once you define what your strategy is or, or what your goals are, then you want to set about identifying candidates. And so when you go about identifying candidates, there's lots of ways to do it. People think that's got to be this awkward, cold outreach thing. Send them an email. Hey, will you will you praise us on you know, recorded uh, you know, audio and all that? It doesn't have to be that way. The first place we look is who's already put up their hand. Do we have this low-hanging fruit? Have people already, out of their own volition, emailed us to talk about their experience or sent us a review or posted you know, on, on a G2 crowd or a Yelp or whatever the equivalent is for industry. That's the low hanging fruit. Is there anybody there who fits the profile of, of what we're looking for? And if there is, hey, approach them because they've already taken the time to tell part of their story. So the chances yeah. that they'll be willing to tell more are really low, uh, are really high, I, I should say. Um, from there, let's say there's not a whole lot of that. You want to start talking to people. And so whether that is sending out a customer survey and getting some feedback and getting people to tell bits of their stories, whether that's picking up the phone and looking through your client base and saying, okay, we think these, these are the people or the companies that might fit the profile of the stories we want to tell and phoning them up and having conversations and seeing if they'll be willing. It all starts well before fingers start banging on a keyboard. There's this consideration and this outreach. Um, then when it comes time to tell the story, that's when the rubber meets the road. So much of the story hinges on a great interview. If you don't run a great interview, you won't have a good story. And you can't tell a customer success story without the customer being part of that story. You can't do these in isolation. You can't lock yourself in a room and go, oh, yeah, we did great work for them. Let's write about it. If, if yeah. your customer doesn't contribute to that conversation, it's not their story. It's yours. And people can tell. Uh, so running a great interview means asking about experience, not opinion. We're not interested if they thought it was good, if it was bad. We're interested in their experience of it. What was it like? What was going on in your business that led you to look for a solution like ours? What did that feel like? What was most frustrating about that? What else did you try and why didn't that work? And so I mentioned before the before, during, after framework, and that's what we use for those interviews is we ask them about their lives before. We ask about their experience and what was memorable or surprising. Then we ask them about the results. So, so much hinges on that. Hmm. So do you do the interviews for your clients on, on their behalf? Yeah, we do. And I think that's one thing that can scare a lot of companies because like, ooh, a third party talking to my customer because your customer is, you know, there, there are some precious assets, right? These relationships, you've worked hard to cultivate them. And that's why I think 
a, a lot of people shy away from from doing these things is because it's awkward to talk to people. It's awkward mm. when you own the relationship to get on a call and have an honest conversation about what did we do great? What did we do poorly? What did that feel like? Because it's you, right? Of course, if, if yeah. I asked you to give me a testimonial and we're sitting on a video chat, I'm like, hey, uh, give me a testimonial. Instantly, that's awkward. And you're going to... Mm. You know, you're, you're going to kind of spit out something like a platitude or you're going to say, oh, it was really great. I love, you know, for most people on both sides, they kind of freeze up. So as a third party, we aren't worried about that. We can come in and we can ask both positive questions, negative mm. questions. What did that feel like? And so there's a lot of trust building that we as a business have to do before that happens to get people comfortable with the fact that we're going to talk to their most precious asset in their customers. But we find when you've got that arm's length distance, we'll learn things that maybe companies wouldn't have been able to learn mm. on their own. Yeah, I think that that's really valuable. So that that gives you a lot of uh, really great information to write a good case study. But I imagine it also can give you a lot of great information to feedback to the business that they, some of which they may not be aware of. Completely. So we've had conversations that have led to product changes. Uh, where, where based on the feedback we've gotten in multiple interviews, because we ask, like I, like I said, it's important when you've got a customer on the phone, do not waste that opportunity just asking them to praise you. You want to learn the why behind it and where could you go from here? What could that look like? So we've had conversations that were case study interviews, but they led to product changes. Uh, the language that a customer will use when describing their problems and their challenges and the desired outcomes, that's the exact same stuff that I use in my work on conversion copy to write compelling headlines and bullet points and structure sales pages. So there is an enormous amount of value beyond just the case study itself. When you are able to capture a customer's experience, record it, listen back to it, analyze the language they use, get a sense for the priorities, the things they brought up over and over and how they talked about it. You can take that same language and use that in your sales and marketing. And it's like showing your customer a mirror. Now they can see your, themselves in your sales mm. copy. And the way you talk about their problems is the way they talk about their problems. So it's a massive empathy building exercise. And we've even had conversations where someone has agreed to give a case study and then we interview them. And when it comes down to it, they're deeply unhappy. Now that sounds crazy, but that's happened. We've done hundreds of interviews. That's happened two or three times. So it's mm. not just this one-off you know, event. And so having conversations with your customer in, in general is this totally undervalued, underappreciated, underutilized thing. Um, and it's something that I think the best companies in their fields, you talk about customer experience, the only way that customer experience continues to get better over time is talking to customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that, there's a, so much gold in what you've just said there. And um, I think, you know, having the ability to have a third party come in and have that kind of honest conversation um, can, as you say, can give you so much more information that that can be applied right across the board. So it's almost a case for um, doing that with you, regardless of whether you then use the information as a case study or, um, you know, just to get that mirror held up and improve your sales copy, maybe even, you know, set your future direction um, around that. So I guess what one of the things you're talking about there and certainly you mentioned it when you started about the process was getting really clear about your own why and and goals and where you're headed and also about who the target ideal customer is who who are you trying to attract with this case study so talk to me a little bit about how you go about figuring all that out because i know in the work we do that a lot of um, our clients and a lot of businesses out there uh, really wishy-washy about this. Yeah, and I've had so many conversations even over the past week where people have spent all kinds of money on ad campaigns or email series without ever really stopping to think like, hey, who is this going to and why will they find any of this valuable in the first place? And so I think in business, the natural inclination, I think, for a lot of entrepreneurs and people trying to innovate is just to push the gas and go, go, go. And, you know, there's there's this, I forget the actual saying, but some like success loves speed or whatever, you know, something like that. And I think in the midst of all that, we've kind of lost this this value of stopping, pausing. And again, it, to, to me, it comes down to having 
real conversations with people. And so for the company, you've got goals, you've got areas you want to grow in. I think for too many businesses, you're trying to aimlessly grow in all directions all the time where any revenue influx seems like a win. But sometimes short-term revenue increases lead to long-term pain when you've chosen the wrong market or you've you know, diversed into a service that actually you're not really that well equipped to provide, or you're trying to do too much for too many people. And so for, for our clients and, and for my own business, this is a, a practice that's hard to, to do, but it starts by getting br- brutally honest and a little bit ruthless about it. What you saying, okay, no, we can't talk to everybody. Right. And it's not that you can't write different case studies for different groups or different services, or different areas, but you got to focus at some point and say, okay, we, we're not trying to sell to everybody. Who is the best fit for, for where we want to go? We've got these goals, but be specific about it. We don't just want revenue goals. We don't just want you know, KPIs in terms of finances. Where are we trying to grow and why are we trying to grow there? Why do we want to serve that market? What makes us a better solution to serve these people than our peers or than our competitors or than the old way of doing things? And so there's exercises that you go through where you get really honest about your unique value proposition. What is it that we do really well and who do we do that best for? And most often that's where kind of the focus of your stories is going to come out of where, you know, instead of trying to write a generic success story about a generic result, when you understand this is what we're really good at, this is where we want to grow into. These are the people that we want to to grow uh, towards and with over time. I think that's the other thing is who do you want to work with over time? Like what lights mm-hmm. you up? What Where are you most successful today? And is that where you want to continue to be most successful in the future? And I think when you get honest about that and when you get clear on that, that changes a lot of conversations in the business because it's no longer about just – you know, being the octopus that reaches for every single shiny object within reach. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, great advice. And I think you mentioned earlier um, an example of, um, was it a physiotherapist or chiropractor? I can't remember now, but if if you're in a software business and you've got, um, you want to work with technical folks and you get somebody to write a case study that's a chiropractor in the health services and you didn't actually enjoy working with them, well, what's going to happen is you're going to attract more of those people. So, Yeah, I mean, it's the the real simple line that I tell the people is, hey, the stories that you tell will be the stories you attract. So, mm. you know, whether it's the client you want to feature, whether it's the problem you want to solve, um, the stories that you put out there will be the stories that, that you start to attract and so if you don't want to work with chiropractors or yoga instructors, don't have stories about those people. Yeah. Um, you know, there, yes, to some degree, you can still leverage successes in other areas to put towards successes mm. in new areas. That's a whole different conversation. But generally, I think a huge blind spot for companies is just telling any story that comes easily to them. Uh, and, and that's really not the best way to go about it. When you have a little bit of intention and you have some strategy behind what you're doing, uh, then those studies stop just being one more content asset and they start being these super powerful sales and marketing weapons that you can deploy in so many different scenarios. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Just stories that you tell are the stories that you'll attract. Yeah, it's great. We'll have to quote that one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Now you mentioned earlier, you've got a team and, and you've, uh, so how long have you been going with, um, case study buddy? Yeah, I should, I should know this down to the month, but I don't, uh, okay. I think we're, I think we're coming up on uh, three and a half or four years at this point. Okay. So, and you've had some quite significant growth then in that time. So how did, how did you manage that growth? Because you mentioned earlier that you'd uh, set up a blogging business earlier and that, that, uh, fell over and that uh, you had a lot of uh, hard lessons there. Yeah. I mean, so first let's briefly talk about why that failed and I can sum it up really quickly. I went in with the assumption that everybody is going to respect the same process I have, hit deadlines, do things the same way that I do them. Like I went in making a lot of assumptions because I was so focused on the opportunity and the dollar signs and just the thought that, hey, if I can grow this, if I can get three writers, we can do this volume. If I can get 10 writers, we can do this volume. I didn't do it 
process first. I did it like people first. I went and got all the people and then like, oh, we'll figure out the process as we go. And that was a disaster. That was, a, you know, it's so easy to look back on that and be like, oh, what an, what an idiot, what an obvious mistake. But when you're in the thick of business, the obvious becomes obscure. It becomes difficult yeah. to see the forest for the trees sometimes. And so with Case Study Buddy, we did things very differently. You want to talk about growth. I had the novelty of Case Study Buddy being a profitable side project in the early goings on. Like I still have my own consulting work that was paying my bills. For me, this was a side gig with a lot of opportunity. And so for the first year, we didn't market Case Study Buddy at all. In fact, all I really did was take it to peers and say, I gave them a price they couldn't possibly refuse. And I went in with the mentality. All I told them was, listen, this is something I'm exploring. I think there's a real opportunity here. I want to do this for you. I want to do it at a cost that is going to be a no brainer for you. And I'm here to learn. You're going to get an asset. I gave them a no lose situation where I said, you know what, if you're, if at the end of this, you're really not happy with the asset we produce, of course, I'm going to refund you because I'm learning here too. I had the novelty of doing that, but we were kind of like stealth mode for the first full year where we were just trying to get that process right. Working on what can go wrong, what happens, you know, that we need to anticipate. We were trying to patch holes in our dinghy before trying to build a cruise ship because small problems in the dinghy become massive problems anytime you, you get bigger. So we spent a full year, uh, first just me, and then the second person that I brought in was my partner, Jen. And that was out of a realization. Once I knew that the opportunity was really, truly there, I needed somebody who would complement the skills that I don't feel like I, I have as well. So Jen's real good at biz dev. She can cold call. I cannot. She was a rock star project manager at the agency that I used to work for. So she had a skill set that I, I don't necessarily have. And with her on board, we could identify more problems and have two heads in the game to solve them. So we started really slow. It was something that just we kind of worked behind the scenes on, you know, working on that. And it wasn't honestly really until about the middle of last year that we went, all right, we, we had grown organically. We got, we started getting a lot of word of mouth because again, when you're in kind of this blue ocean space where you have hardly any competitors um, and you, you do good work because you figured out the process in, in the early goings on, we started to kind of get the snowball rolling. So to date, and this is not a brag, this is a bad thing, but we've never done a paid ads campaign. We've never really done a cold outreach campaign. The extent that we've done is like, We've run some small amount of ads around certain conference hashtags, like maybe two times, and the rest has all been word of mouth. That's not a great thing if you're trying to grow a business, but for us, again, we had the novelty of not having to go all in right away. But in the past, kind of since since about the middle of last year, we started taking it really seriously because we thought, okay, now is the time. We've got this opportunity. We've got to seize it. And so because we were process first and then started bringing people in, once we started bringing in writers or interviewers, they knew what was expected and they knew how to win. The game had rules. It wasn't just, oh, you know, like figure it out on your own. Everybody says they want entrepreneurial people on their team. Yes, you do, but you need to give those entrepreneurial people constraints with which to iterate and innovate. Yeah. If you just set them loose, yeah. who knows? So, yeah, we, we've seen a lot of growth and we this year uh, we'll, we'll do close to, if things continue, as there are three times the business we did last calendar year. So it's been really encouraging and a big part of that now has been refining the process, but now we've got more people to help kind of keep things moving. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So how big's the team now? That is a wonderful question. So at the core <laughs> leadership team, I would say there's three of us. There's myself and Jen, and then uh, the most wonderful woman on the planet, Morgan, who keeps our projects on track. She's one of those uh, people who just loves that side of things. She loves organizing and scheduling and standard operating procedures. So she is a wonderful person to have. So there's kind of the three of us uh, kind of keeping the engine running. And then at this point, we've got two interviewers soon to have three. Uh, and then a writing team of about, I, I think we're at six or seven. Now, not everybody is busy all the time. Not everybody is like full time on always going. Uh, so because, you know, we're, we're still, our model is still contractors. So we have kind of dedicated contracts that work with us for a long time. We're now getting to the point that employees are starting to, to really make sense and to go down that path. Uh, but at this point, we've got a team of somewhere between 10 and 15. Mm -hmm. So you have different people doing the interviews than, than writing the case studies at the end? 
Yeah, and that's one of the things that we learned during that quiet period when we were figuring out the process. One of the things that we learned, and not that this is true in all cases, but there are some serious efficiencies to just letting people who are exceptional in one area focus on just that area. And so we found by trying to work with different people and even trying to do it ourselves, um, it's fairly uncommon for someone to be really deeply proficient at running a fantastic interview and also telling an amazing story. Now, journalists, they fall into that bucket for sure. And we do have some who are, are you know, good, good on both sides. But even from an opera, operational standpoint, what we found is it's much easier in terms of keeping the engine moving and humming to have somebody just own and have their whole schedule and time and expertise focused on capturing the best story and then have a team that's focused on just telling that story in the best possible way. There's more seamless handoff. We get, you know, if one person's interviewing and writing, their time gets booked up fast. Whereas if mm. I can just do interview after interview after interview and I can just write and write and write on the other side of things, we can produce much more without compromising any of the quality. We can let people just excel in the areas that they really excel. And that was an unexpected thing for, for us at the beginning. And it's something that at least so far uh, has paid some serious dividends in terms of how we get things done. Okay. And so who works with the customer on the strategy and kind of setting the, you know, well, defining the strategy and goals to start with and then setting the um, path yeah, that's been the toughest thing. And that's the thing that we continue to work on now. So right now it's myself and Jen. Um, we both come from that business background agency side mm -hmm. where that's that's a big part of what we did. Uh, and so Morgan will kind of bring the client in and Jen or I will have a call with them and talk about what are your needs and what are you trying to do and how do you want to use these assets and where are you at today? And so we collect all of that information, we distill it down, and then the rest of the team has this reference point to operate off of. Um, there have been challenges in that, that uh, you know, when, when you've got a company that has a lot of different touch points, for example, hmm. uh, somebody who's onboarding, somebody who's doing strategy, somebody who's doing the interview, somebody who's doing the writing, we have to work four times as hard to make sure that that customer doesn't feel like they're bouncing around like a ping pong ball and who the heck am I supposed to talk to today? And so we're putting a lot of work in, into that. And we've got, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the way that uh, we, we've done that and, and we're continuing to grow and get better. My favorite book this entire year uh, is Never Lose a Customer Again by, by a guy named Joey Coleman. Fantastic book because it walks you through the seven stages of a customer relationship and gets you thinking about how do I make that experience as positive and cohesive and, you know, great, frankly, as possible. How do I make sure that everyone who comes in, you talked about earlier, right? People don't just buy the product, they buy the experience of it. We've had to become painfully aware of that when stuff doesn't work. So for us, our, our big focus over the past you know, couple months and continuing on in the future, future is looking at our customer experience, being ruthless and brutally honest about it and saying, how do we continue to make this feel more cohesive and better and friendlier? And, uh, and, and that's, that's where a large amount of our energy is going to and why I'm so grateful to have someone like Morgan who just eats that up and does a brilliant job of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, how do you keep everyone then on your team on the same page as far as, you know, here's, here's what we're aiming to achieve. Here's the customer's strategy and goals. Here's their ideal client. Here's who we're talking to and so on. Yeah, we centralize that information. So we've had to get real good at documentation. We've had to get real good at communication and making sure that, you know, we, we have people who don't work out with us because they just want to jump in and get going. Where for us, hmm. the ability to slow down, consider the details, pay attention, read the brief, you know, dig deeper, ask questions. I think a lot of people are scared uh, when they get hired to work with a company, when they're partnering with the company to ask questions or make a suggestion say, um, by the way, this could be better, or this is something that maybe isn't working so well. We love those people because they're in the thick of it. And when someone puts up their hand and says, I've got an idea for how this could be better, then we all get better around that. So for us, it's, you know, we use software to help facilitate that and make sure that we're tracking what stage things are at and how things are progressing. We use people, you know, to, to help facilitate that, to make sure that the handoff is, is pretty seamless. And then we've had to get real good at documentation, making sure that things are spelled out and clear and easy to digest. Because if I hand a writer a, a seven page brief, 
they're never going to read it. They're never going to absorb mm. it. We're never going to be time or cost effective. So we've had to get good at distilling things down. Mm. Mm. That's great. Lots of good advice there. All right. Well, I'm looking at the time and uh, aware that we've been going for quite a while. I could keep talking about case studies and how you do things and how you're building the business for ages, but I think it's a good time now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with mm -hmm. some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions. Hopefully, we'll get some really insightful answers in addition to all the insights you've given us so far and um, inspire people to go and do something awesome today. All right. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Talk to people. That's, that's the <laughs> simplest way to boil it down. Uh, companies pay lip service to the idea of talking to customers, but the ones that actually do it innovate faster, innovate more intentionally, uh, and, and stay ahead. You cannot serve people that you do not understand. So talk to people, have structured conversations with them. Hmm, great advice and and you know clearly what you're doing with case study buddy is is one way to do that but you've demonstrated that case study buddy as a business came out of actually doing that so listening to customers and listening to that input what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas Get, get in small groups of peers and they don't even have to be in your industry. Uh, they don't even have to be um, at the same point you're at, but get in groups with people who have multiple different perspectives and most importantly, aren't afraid to tell you that your poop stinks. So you need people around you who will tell you when your ideas are bad, who will challenge you. You need people, just as we all need people who will build us up and make us feel good and encourage us. We also need people who will tell us that's a bad idea or have you thought about this? We need those people with those needly little fingers to poke holes in the things we're working on. <laughs> so I've got a great support group that's helped me with that. Yeah, that's that's um, great advice. And I love the you know people that will tell you if, if they don't like something, people that will... Um call you to task if you're not doing what you said you do for example mm -hmm. is another one um, so yeah i love that because uh, a lot of people are afraid of doing that um, and yet it is such a valuable service yeah keeps I mean, you obvious, honest obvi <laughs> yeah obvi obviously you don't need to be rude or no, arrogant no. or uh, nasty about it but uh, yeah. yeah all right what's uh, uh do you have a favorite resource that you use most often you know, I mentioned that Joy Coleman book, and I honestly got to say for this year, that is something that I just keep going back to. If I, I think we all need to work harder on our customer experience, because as you mentioned, people buy the experience. And I think a big part of the reason that companies grow organically, you can throw money at ads, you can throw money at SEO, you can throw money at this, that, and the other thing. But how often do we stop and think about the way people feel as they engage with us and the questions they have and how easy we're making that? So uh, Joey Coleman's book, Never Lose a Customer Again, is, has just been such a fantastic resource for me this year. Hmm. Great. I'm going to have to look that one up. I, I wasn't familiar with that, so I'll check that one out and have a read. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track or, or even a client on track as you're moving through your processes? I've got to say that my mind has changed on this in the past year. So in the past, I would have said, you know, having a clean, well-documented process and communicating it well. But over the past year, I've just seen the power of having somebody be in charge of owning that process and checking in. And so having a person responsible for that and owning that and having that as a focus, I think the minute that you can afford to do that and the minute you find someone who excels at that, hold on to them and, and do whatever it takes to keep them around uh, because there's no replacement. Software is great. Documentation is great. But at the end of the day, you need somebody to be kind of the watchdog and to enforce things and to keep those projects on track by bringing that process to life. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it comes back to the point you were making earlier about you know the experience and the human experience and i think it comes into internal things as well that whilst we can have really good processes and really good documentation there's still people that have to carry them out completely yeah hmm. all right now what's the number one thing you think anyone can do to differentiate themselves 
apart from I mean, having great case studies. <laughs> yeah, apart from having great case studies. Um, you know, I, I think when you're thinking about differentiation, my perspective on this is how can you show people that you've thought through their problem um, and, and you can solve it? Now, whether that's a case A, that's one thing, but I think there's so much value in teaching and positioning yourself as a teacher in sharing and giving there's still even in this content marketing era and age there's still this hesitation to to give and to put stuff out there because the thought is well if i if i give all this information away then what will people pay me for and the mm-hmm. honest truth is you know that my experience has been the opposite um when you give, when you teach, when you share, when you're blunt and honest and truthful about the challenges you have and the problems that you can solve, um, you know, wh- whatever that looks like for you, uh, do more teaching, uh, do do more sharing, do more giving, worry less about the immediate return. And that return, I think it sounds a bit woo, but I think that return does come back. Mm. Yeah. And again, I mentioned earlier, I absolutely, I agree with you. Um, I mentioned earlier the books, the Go Giver, and the stories that they had in there, and that that is very much the philosophy there. But it, they put it in a really uh, good way that it doesn't come across as that woo woo. And they do kind of in the story, you know, the the protagonist then um, is working with mentors, and he does say, "Well, this sounds a bit woo woo," and so on. So that he does kind of uh, raise the questions, but then there's lots of really good explanations and and case studies, if you like, in the mm-hmm. story of how that plays out in real life that most people would be able to relate to. So that's really great advice. You know, teach, give away your know how, um, and that positions you as the expert. And also, I think one of the things. People forget that, um, well, there's two aspects. Is you can, I mean, you could teach people to do case studies, yet most people will say, well, that's not a core part of our business. We don't have the resources to do that. We don't have the time to do that. Um, you seem to know what you're doing. We'll get you to do that because that's your business. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, smart people will operate in that way because they will realize that time, their time is valuable and the, their time is best spent earning money from the things that they're really good at and they can then spend that money to do other things that build assets that other people produce because that's what those other people are good at. So that, that to me is sort of one aspect of it. And the other aspect is that a lot of people see the information but still really don't know how to go about implementing it in real life so they're going to come to you as well because you're the one sharing that information and so they think well first of all it makes a lot of sense secondly you seem to know what you're doing and you've been very generous so far yeah i mean uh, the perfect a quick little (laughs) analogy on that is we're looking at replacing the windows in our house and the people who have made the biggest impression on me I I will never, I will never have the know-how to take a window out and put one in. (laughs) You know, that's not for me. But the people who took the time to explain the how and the why and what this looks like and what to expect, they left the best impression. Not the guys who came in and said, hey, we can do it for this price, we're the cheapest. The people who educated me, even though I, Mm. I will never do that myself, there's a real comfort in knowing that the people you're working with have thought it through. I've said it a few times, but when you can demonstrate that you've thought this through and you can articulate it to somebody else, there's a real comfort in that. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, great. Well, thanks for getting us through the buzz, Joel. And uh, so I'm, yeah, I have a couple of additional questions, but first of all, thanks for the whole interview. It's been really great. I've sort of really enjoyed this and learned a lot about case studies, but also about your entire approach and how you've grown the business. So I think there's a lot of congruence right throughout everything you're doing. Now, where can people reach out, find out more about you and perhaps even get in touch to say thank you? Yeah. So if if you want to talk to me or ask me a question, the two best places to do it are either Twitter at Joel Kletke 
uh, or LinkedIn. So, you know, you're welcome to, to connect with me there. And uh, I'm not always fast uh, to, to answer questions <laughs> or respond, but I always do my best to. Uh, if you're interested in learning about Case Study Buddy, we have lots of articles, things. It's not just, you know, I'm not just here to pitch you on that. But if you want more information or you want to amp up the work you're already doing or take some of these lessons or have some resources and reference, casestudybuddy.com is another great place to to get some resources to learn uh, and to you know dive into our samples and see what other companies are, are doing in terms of telling their stories. Mm. All right, and we'll have links to those in the show notes so people can click straight through. Now, what number one sort of parting piece of advice would you leave our listener for anyone that wants to be a leader in innovation and in their field? You know, I'm I'm going to cheat because it's it's just this important the the idea <laughs> of talking to people go back and connect with people and have deliberate uh, conversations and um you know when you listen to people and when you take the time to try to get in their shoes when you ask questions about the pain points that they have and the anxieties they're dealing with and the ways that they want to solve those problems. That's when you really start getting those insights that lead to innovative ideas. And I guess the other thing I, I would tie it back to kind of where we started is be open to new things. Don't just, there, there's something we said for focus and staying in your lane, but sometimes you just got to say, you know what, we can do that. We can figure it out. And you never know where that's going to go. When I took on that project, I had no idea it was going to lead to spinning off a whole second company. So be open to new ideas, new experiences, uh, and, and doing things that maybe scare you a little bit. I think that's where mm-hmm. so much of the, the innovation and, and uh, experience of, of that comes from. Yeah, great advice. And yeah, there's a lot to gain from talking to people and understanding what their challenges and frustrations and also their aspirations are, which then you know opens up those ideas that, that you might take on board if you're open to the new possibilities like you mentioned. Totally. All right. Now, finally, who would you like me to chat with on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Oh, I think there's there's lots of people uh, that you could talk to, but some that are top of mind for me. Um, two people that I, I deeply respect are Samar Owe uh, and Iman Zabi. Samar Owe is an email copywriter. She's very quickly carving out uh, a niche for herself and, and getting some great clients on her list. She's got a fantastic process. And part of what's so fascinating about her story um, and similar to Iman is just innovation and business growth in the face of bias and prejudice. And, you know, to, to, to have names like they have and comes come from places like they do um, that the obstacles they've had to overcome on their way to innovating and growing have been uh, unique. So Iman is also a very talented copywriter. She works a lot on, on um, launches and different things like that. And beyond just the raw skill sets of both of them, um, their experiences in growing their businesses and overcoming these other obstacles on the road uh, to innovation and growth and, and staring down those questions, I think, are, would be valuable for people even just to understand uh, and, and to grow from. So there are two people that would come to mind relatively quickly. Um, and then I would honestly say, if you have the uh, luxury of talking to the man behind the book himself, Joey Coleman, I feel like he would just be such a fascinating person to talk to in terms of customer experience. Um, he's he's deep on that. He communicates it so well. And I feel like he'd have just piles of actionable insights for, for your listeners. Okay. Well, that's great. We've got three for the price of one. So we'll... Uh, <laughs> we'll... See if we can get introductions to Samar and Iman, is it? Iman, yeah. From you and um, we'll see if we can reach out to Joey and, well, I'll read his book first yeah. and then we'll um, reach out to him, see if we can get him on. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today, Joel. This has been really fun. I mean, there's so much value in what you've shared today around how valuable an asset really good case studies are and how you can go about those and also the whole message around talking to your customer, being close to your customer, getting feedback from the customer to understand what experience they're actually having with you rather than just um, what is it that you do for them in terms of product or service. So thanks so much and I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Cheers. Thank you. That's been a great chat.
hope you enjoyed that engaging and insightful conversation with Joel and took something away from what he shared with us today. Joel's focus on service and talking to your clients, not just for case studies, but also to find out how to better serve them and improve your business, that was my biggest takeaway. I'd love to know what you took away from Joel's episode. Go ahead and leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Joel Kletke. That is J-O-E-L-K-L-E-T-T. K-E, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Joel Kletke. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Joel there, as well as links to the Case Study Buddy website, his social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in today's conversation. Joel suggested that we have a conversation with Samar Owais, email conversion strategist, also with Eamon Zabi, the founder of The Scribe Smith, and further, the author of Never Lose a Customer Again, Joey Coleman, on future Innova Buzz podcast episodes. Three for the price of one. Wonderful. So, Samar, Eamon, and Joey, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Joel Kletke. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free, but most importantly, in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into marketing mastery, or our help with podcast production, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a conversation, no obligation, and find out if we're indeed a good fit for one another. Tune in again next week to the InnovaBuzz podcast. We've got some more fantastic guests lined up, including Nick Nanton, documentary film producer, and Heather Lee Dyer, the author of Creativity Over Perfection. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.co